If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, oh, like- are we going high? Yes. Uh, I don't have that ability. So in this episode... <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. You're always high. You can't, huh? No. Try. No, 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 no. Just try a little high. Why do you do that? Hi. Wow, that was... Why? Hi. No. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Mind Pump. In this extremely uncomfortable <laughs> yeah. episode of Mind Pump, Adam, Justin, and I... Uh, this is before we went through puberty, apparently. Uh. We do our intro conversation for the first 29 minutes. We talk about the new Sal and Justin show. Yeah. <laughs> Debuting. Our first debut. Feel, feel free to fast forward the first two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> we talk about death. We talk about Adam's clothing matching ability. It's borderline genius. It's <laughs> it's very interesting. We talk about the juve light and how it's affecting Adam's testicles. And his psoriasis. By the way, we are sponsored by Juve. Actually, we're not. We have a, an affiliate code with them. Yeah, we hook you up. With we hook you up. Anyway, so if you go to Juve, J-O-O-V-V dot com forward slash mind pump, you'll get a discount on near infrared. They light. should pay us for as much as I talk about That's it. That's what I'm oh, saying. Man. Uh, we also talk about why the nose and the ears keep growing as you age. Uh, kind of turn into a gnome. Then we talk about Health IQ. Now, they do sponsor us. If you go to healthiq.com forward slash mind pump, you can take a fitness quiz and get a free quote on life insurance. I also mentioned the gold juice from Organifi. It is delicious. It is relaxing. It is anti-inflammatory. And it tastes expensive. If you go to Organifi- And it goes good with vodka. It, it Maybe. <laughs> I haven't tried that yet. I don't know. We were speculating and it uh, sounds delicious. If you go to OrganifiShop.com, uh, you can enter the code mind pump, no space, and get a discount. And then we also mentioned- the brand Spanking New Mind Pump T-shirts. These uh, designs are great, Justin. Thank you. I think yeah. you did a very, very good job. They'll keep coming. And, and ladies, don't worry. I'm coming for you. <laughs> That's creepy. I, well, that was creepy. <laughs> then we get Let me the- say, <laughs> I'm coming up with some designs for you. He's yeah. coming. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm going to clarify <laughs> All that. over the place. Yeah. Then we get into the <laughs> questions. Yeah. Uh, the first question was, what is the benefit of stopping two reps before Failure. So we always mention on the show, or we have many times, that it's probably more beneficial for most people to not train to failure all the time, or at least we recommend you stop one or two reps short of failure. Why do we say that? Is it because we want to be different and we're rebels, or is it because there's science actually supporting it? The next question was, why is it that when this particular individual is sick, they crave kind of shitty food, like white toast and crackers? The thought of healthy foods or vegetables makes them nauseous. What's going on here? Why is it that when they're sick, they want processed food? I get it. 16 and pregnant does it to me every time. <laughs> uh, the next question was, why are some of the exercise in Prime Pro, why do they make you cramp? Like when you get into these positions to gain new ranges of motion, muscle cramping is quite common. It's painful. Is it or are you just being a pussy? Mm. <laughs> Find, Find out, out in this episode. Find Could out be soon. that. Uh, and the final question was, is it beneficial for performance-based individuals to cross-train in different sports? Or should they just focus on their one sport? Uh, The answer to this is it depends. Find out why it depends in this episode. Also, we just talked about Prime Pro in this episode. We talk about correctional exercise and mobility. If you're really good with your routine, you've got a great routine, you've been working out for a while, or you want to correct muscle imbalances, or you want to improve your range of motion when you train. Or you're just really smart. We recommend you get the MAPS Prime Bundle. Now, the Prime Bundle includes MAPS Prime, which teaches you how to set up your warm-up properly, what we like to call your priming sessions Both properly. these programs go with anybody else. Pro, so you don't need to be following the MAPS programs to use these programs in conjunction Super with Super complimentary to anything you're doing right now. If you're not doing it, you're an idiot. That's right. And Prime Pro is more correctional. It focuses on joints. So we do everything from the wrist, the shoulder, the shoulder blade, the spine, uh, the hips, the ankles, the feet, Um, It addresses all those areas. If you have any imbalances in those areas, it helps correct them, which then results in greater strength, greater mobility, more muscle, less body fat. It's extremely beneficial. If you're a personal trainer, these programs are absolutely invaluable. Now, you can get them separately. You can buy MAPS Prime or Prime Pro separately, or you can get them in the bundle where they're discounted over 20% off, which is what we recommend. For more information, go to mindpumpmedia.com. 
Remember how we said we wanted to start a new podcast called The Sal and Justin Show? Yeah. This is our chance. Finally. We need a theme song. Yeah, we do need a theme song. The Sal and Justin Show. How would it start? The Sal and Justin (laughs) Show. It's coming at you every day. We're fucking crazy. We say some shit that doesn't make sense. And then Sal put some science at the end. Study show. That was pretty good. <laughs> I don't know. I like that. That was um, very, you, very on on the spot. You're like, you're brilliant at making up random songs. No, I just make shit up. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a level of brilliance that well, is, first you have to find kind of like a driving beat, like ding 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 ding, and then the rest is easy. Yeah, if the lyrics are always hard for me. If the audience, if the audience only knew, because right now they're basing what I'm saying off of. The few songs you've done on Mind Pump, which are which are smart, but yeah. they're not brilliant. The brilliant no, songs no, you do not. are the ones <laughs> the, the explicits, the ones that we can never air. Yeah, they're terrible. We do those only for the road trips. Yeah, they're they're really bad. Yeah, they're so bad they can't even be aired on Mind Pump. Yeah, yeah. I like the mystery of that though. You know? <laughs> no. well, let's keep that in the family. I hope nobody ever finds out the songs that you write. <laughs> And sing in the car or run around. It's like trip. it's like exercising a lot of the darkness. Yeah, you know? <laughs> dude. Yeah, it's bad. It is bad. It's but, really but bad. Some of your uh, humor. Uh, oh no, you've been no, posting no. lately. Oh, on my my Insta story. Yeah, I guess oh, it's not that not, bad. It's just dark. No, that's not that dark, dude. No. I can get so. No, dark. I know you get. I know you can go. You know who's super dark? Uh, uh, doctors. Yeah. So I, you know, I've trained. A you lot think of, that's like a, a mechanism, like a coping mechanism for all this trauma and stress and I think shit? You, that they I go think through? you have to be dark when yeah. you're when you're when you see people die and they're sick and, yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah, so right. Their humor is terrible. Yeah, like uh, disturbingly terrible. I would imagine that would be the case too with like coroners and you know, like people that deal with dead people all the time. They probably fuck with them while they're dead. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, <laughs> look, he's talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can yeah. you imagine? Anyway, uh, walking in on that. So I would like to introduce our guest in the show to in the Sal and Justin show today. The Sal and Justin <laughs> show. Are you having a hard time it's filling fire. dead space over there? <laughs> <laughs> no, the, what's, going on? what's going on over today's there? Today's special guest. <laughs> and that was I, it. That was all the content that yeah. we had Adam, for the day. Thanks for showing up, Adam. Adam it was I, good. I walk into good time. to morgue talk. How the fuck you guys go? <laughs> Dude, <laughs> the hell you guys get there? Bro, you I don't know, know what? Can I just say just something? How, how it works out. So Adam makes a lot of claims about his his fashion sense like oh i'm so stylish i'm so and i always make fun uh, of him and i laugh and oh, here it comes but i'm not gonna this is true now i'm not gonna joke around anymore because i like to tease people right but let's be honest now he's got on okay because he has a, he's got a cast on his foot basically because he's okay. got a busted ankle but he has wait, wait, a, what color socks first he's got so a red all makes sense he's got a red sock that matches his hat perfectly yeah and then on the other foot because the other foot's not hurt so the other foot has a shoe on it he's only wearing one shoe nowadays by the way yeah his oh one shoe. His Adam. shoe. Look at the color of the swipe on his Nike, and then look at his shirt. Okay. It's it's all. He's like opposite matchy. It's perfect. Yeah. It's all perfect. <laughs> now you either plan that or it was. Oh, I yeah no I I take the time when I put when I put a pair of socks or on it was it. intelligent design. You know what um, I mean? Mm. No, I take the time to do that stuff. And then, I'll be honest. There's times when I don't take the time to do that stuff, but I think it, it makes a difference, man. It's just, I wouldn't it's, have even thought. To match the sock with something, and then the shoe with something else. Well, being completely transparent, the socks is what dictated what went on my head, because I put the socks on for so my. Do my, you start bottom? How does this work? Do you start well, t- bottomed up? I have a very new routine now. That in fact, I was just talking to Taylor about this. That ever since the Juve light has been a part of my life at home, you know, it's. I've noticed, like I told you guys, I've noticed the most uh, benefits from the Juve out of almost anything that I'm doing right now. Not as much hormonally as much as skin like so oh the skin's affected yes I, I, my psoriasis and you can you can even tell like so I my psoriasis on my shins are, are some of the worst areas of my body and uh, the way I sit so what I do is my the juve light if you can imagine this is the edge of my bed and the juve light I, I have rolled against my wall and I just roll it right in front of my bed so I sit at the edge of my bed when I first wake up in the morning and then before I go to bed so I'm trying to use it twice a day because I've seen so much benefit from the, the little bit that I was consistently using. So uh, 
I, I get ready to wake up naked. I sleep naked and then I just turn the light on right away and I kind of sit in front of it and kind of wake up and check my email real quick and kind of start the day like that. And then I shower, come back to the light. I just turn the light on, leave the light on in the room. So my whole room's red. Do you feel like, um, like an entree kind of waiting in a diner? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're just like, you're just hanging out, just waiting to get served. You know what I mean? Delicious. It, it, it does feel I'm so crispy, right? It now. does feel a little, that light really, travels right so katrina pulled up the other night and i was she's like oh my god she goes the red light from our room lights up all the rest of the house like those so she could see the the, the yeah, other it's windows it's fuck. like it's like the devil is coming out in your it, house it, it your looks, neighbors are like what the fuck yeah no it's it, she the says, red it, she says it looks really crazy so anyway so that my my routine now and so i try and leave because i want the benefits too for the testosterone so i'm trying to keep my balls close to it and keep my balls uncovered so typically i would put underwear on first Okay, but I don't anymore. Good, uh, like, so, I, I wanted to use it again at some point. So, <laughs> so I've, just for the audience, so you're sitting on the edge of the bench, knees bent. Yes. Okay. Now, typically the 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 shaft might cover some of the balls. Do you have to move it out of the way? Like, is the is the goal to get? ball exposure oh. or is it just total are you, are you doing like underbelly shaft <laughs> so yeah. I mean? i'm not 100 percent sure on the science of if it's better to get most of my ball sack or most of my shaft i'm assuming it's most of my ball sack would probably be the most beneficial That's my ball mm. sack. so yeah, I, so i my ball sack. <laughs> so i push them to the side so that they can get the the most so the boys get the most yeah the best. boys get the mm. most light you know yeah. and uh smart uh, yeah so but i you know to be honest about the testosterone piece. I know Ben Greenfield uh, is big on this. I haven't, I haven't, but that's such a hard one, right? Testosterone is a very hard one to like pinpoint. You like, have to like measure yeah. your blood. And yeah, stuff. it's really, it's really hard. Although I think, uh, but skin is so visible, right? Exactly, skin's visible, so I could definitely see a difference when I'm when I'm consistently using vitamin D and when I'm not. I can, Let me see your shin. Let me see. Let me see how much better it is. Oh shit. Oh, Look yeah. at that. It has gone yeah, down. Way down. Bit. Well, and it's really it's actually, It's like one maybe one third or one fourth of the size. Yeah, and it's it's actually really it's really it's right now it's, Wow, that's dramatic, dude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That that's a big fucking substantial. difference. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a combination of a, a few things like, you know, my diet ever since we did our fast. Yeah. So the, right before our fast it was really bad. So and I was kind of all over the board. I was eating shit. I was eating whatever I wanted to, holidays still coming you off. You do look healthier. And after the fast, the diet's been pretty tight. Um, and then the vitamin, I've been consistent again with my vitamin D, you know, I was, I was really consistent for a while. Then I fell off and then I realized, uh, that it was starting to get worse again. It's funny how sometimes when we're doing things, I was just having this conversation with Taylor and I were talking about skin and vitamin D and all this stuff. And he's like, you know, I, I've been taking it, but I don't really notice the difference. I'm like, you know what? I thought the same thing too, until I stopped taking it. And then I saw the flare up happen. Sometimes like it's such a subtle thing. You look at yourself so much. Mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to, mm -hmm. and we're, we're all searching for like this big benefit, right? Like you think you're going to do something like that and hopefully it cures it. It gets rid of it. Like the likelihood of that's very, I think very, very slim that it's going to, someone's going to start taking vitamin D and all of a sudden psoriasis goes away, but it does suppress it a mm -hmm. lot. And when it suppresses it, that keeps me from itching and picking at it, which that actually makes it worse. Yeah. So, you know, I, I have seen lots of benefits from the juve light, uh, for the skin thing. I've, been putting my head on there too, you know, hope in hopes, praying into all the, the hair. Oh, gods. your hair, <laughs> oh, hair gods. Yeah. <laughs> like I please let the, let, let, you it know be, what? let it be like one of those infomercials where I, you know, you know what? So it might take a while. It might take time for that, right? Because the whole the cycle of the hair or the follicle or whatever. But are you taking pictures to see if you could tell a difference? I'm not taking pictures, but I fucking look. You better believe I check. You know, yeah. I was just checking yesterday. My head all tilted down with the fucking t double mirrors looking like, okay. It actually, it, it feels like it's thicker. I can feel it, right? When I shampoo, yeah. there's times like when I was on testosterone, when I'm taking, when I'm taking juice and, uh, and I can really feel it thin. Like it feels like it's crazy. I'll run my fingers through my hair and I'm like, oh God, it's like, <laughs> and then as soon as I'm off, as soon as I'm off, I can feel my hair already thicken back up. So I can see a significant difference from that, but I feel like I'm kind of at this one sticking point where it's not really getting better, you know. But it's yeah, not really yeah. getting worse, but it's not really getting better. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so I'll, I'll notice periods of time when I start to lose a little bit of hair, and it, of course it freaks me out, right? Luckily, I still, I'm still okay, but it's way thinner than it used to be, for sure. I'm still not like no one. I don't think anyone will look at my head, my head, and say, "Oh, you're losing your hair." But if you knew what I looked like before, I was a mop, bro. I when I was. For most of my life, up until I'd say my late twenties, like my hair was—I if I didn't wash my hair in the morning and then put like a shit ton of product in it, 
it was a it was like a big old I had a fro Mediterranean dude. afro. Yeah, I had a big fro. It was it was unmanageable, and and now I've embraced the hair loss that I have had because it's not it w- it wasn't so much that it makes me look like I'm losing my hair, but it was enough to make it to give me dad hair, yeah. and I really like dad hair. Yeah, dad hair, <laughs> dude. I dad hair on point. These dad days. hair is great because I remember when I was a kid, my dad used to. I used to ask him, like, how do you comb? Because his hair was always, like, perfectly... I'm like, how do you comb your hair? And he's like, I don't. I just put <laughs> my like, fingers... He's like, son, that's 50 up. years of training at the same yeah. direction. That's what that <laughs> yeah, is. Yeah. He's just 50 years of training him, man. He just <laughs> knows how to get in line. Bro, I can literally mess up my hair and then just a couple swipes of my fingers and it's... Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. You know what I, that's I mean? what that really is, though, right? That's a, that's a testament of combing your hair a certain way for so many years that you start to train the hair to grow... Well, I well I have a theory. So I think that the hair that, it's like vines that falls out first is the ones that are the rebellious, unruly ones. That's why they. Uh, that's why they. That's why they fall out. You know what I mean? Because they're like, I'm out of here. And then the ones that I are like, they just move south. Yeah. And then, <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah. Because that, that increases. You know how terrible. So I'm. We were. You know, we were up in Napa this past weekend, and we're driving, and Jessica's talking to me. And we're having a good conversation. And she stops, and she like gets closer to me, and she's like, "Is that?" hair in your ears yes yeah starts, courtney pointed that out to me too oh freak me out dude she starts trying to pull the hair out of my ears out Ugh. why the fuck do i have hair in my ears why yeah what's i know what's the evolutionary yeah, what's purpose the of that yeah. Uh, yeah. i noticed i noticed that a few years ago so i got one of them little tools those are just game changer bro that's like, a, that's like I got, a sneak attack mechanism i got one in my truck yeah. and i got one in my bathroom i keep it on me because there's be times i'll be driving i'll look in the rearview mirror and I'll just see, like, the sun just hits my ear just right, and this little fucking one little hair the, out of nowhere. The one straggler. Uh, I'll pull the fuck over right there, get my little tool out. For, <laughs> rip it, son oh, of a yeah. bitch out. That hurts. No, no, nose hairs hurt. I want to know why, though. Why do we, what's the evolutionary purpose of hair in the well, ears? Or well, is it just an accident of nature? It's weird to me, too, it's how. Like little tentacles. I actually would expect you to know this answer. Why do our ears and our nose keep growing, too, as we get older? Oh, cartilage. Yeah. So bone will stop, but right. cartilage will continue. And the tip of your nose is cartilage, and your ears are cartilage. And cartilage doesn't doesn't stop growing like bone does. So bone will have like you have growth plates, and once it reaches a certain length, they'll stop. So does that mean for all areas in our body where we have cartilage? So like I'm gonna have these like bulky looking knees too when I get older. Um, that's a good that's a good question. I'm not sure about that, but I do know that cartilage. The reason why that nose and ears grow is because cartilage tends to continue growing. So I don't know. I think that's true because I think cartilage in the rest of your body, like your joints, kind of replaces itself um, if you're healthy and stuff. So it, it's like it repairs differently. But I'm not sure about it. That's a good question. I don't know. But it does keep growing. You're right because you ever look at pictures of like, yeah, oh, okay. like yeah. people who are over 100? Yeah, they have these huge ears. Yeah. Massive. Huge ears. ears. Massive ears. Oh, yeah. wait. It says, okay, so... Let's see here. Uh, the the long term exposure of hair follicles to hormones such as testosterone will disrupt disrupt and lengthen their growing period. Except for your head, though, you fuck. That's crazy. Like your your nose, ear, and eyebrows will just get crazy long. Oh yeah. But your head, like all the areas that looks bad if you have long hair, dude. Yeah, you like see old man old guys. eyebrow. Yeah, I was gonna say the the, <laughs> the crazy like owl unibrow. <laughs> yeah, that thing is. I've seen some gnarly so, ones. I've made a promise myself to take care of that shit as I get older. Eyebrows? Yeah. Just everything. Like, just manscaping all the way around, dude. Just nose, ears, eyebrows. Like, And I don't got to go to the extreme where I'm, you know, getting them tweezed every fucking week or some shit like that. But, you know, to be aware enough when it starts to get a little out of control. Like, okay, it doesn't take me that much time to go somewhere, get it professionally done. I'm taking care of them. You're good for at least a month or two. Yeah, because yeah. sometimes I could just, like, see them. You know, they, like, oh, curl oh, down. Oh, like, through your vision? And they're just like... Whoosh. <laughs> it's fucked up. Yeah, no. Yeah, I feel bad for my wife. She's always like, ah, do something about that. Well, you know, I mean, to be fair, the kind of things that men have to do to like take care of themselves, it pales in comparison to like, like women. Oh, I How know. many women do you see over the age of 35, okay, over the age of 35 who have like gray hair? Rare. It's mm. rare until they get really old and they stop giving a shit. Do you know? I mean, I don't, this was mind blowing to me. Most I don't know why it was mind blowing. It's obvious. Most women get gray hair like guys do after we get a certain age. Except they all color. Yeah. All women color the hair. They, they totally all hide the it. time. Yeah, all the time. Which you know I don't know. What do you guys think about gray hair on women? Do you think it's unattractive? Like if a thirty five year old woman has got like grays, do you think that? They should color it or yeah, I don't think? know, man. I, I guess I haven't seen it that much, so I, I like it. Just I, exposure. I got I guess. a client that I was just talking to. She's fifty one. 
and she has it. She says she claims that her whole head would be completely silver if she didn't color it. But right now I see like she needs she's telling me that she was just telling me she's due to go back in. And I'm looking at I think it looks she's blonde or she dyes it blonde, I guess. And she has these streaks of gray in it. And I think when it's when it's kind of streaky like that, both men and women, I think I think it's yeah. kind of a cool look. It's and I do think I agree. Look. I do think that some some at least men, and I'm trying to think of a woman in my head because I know there's some famous actors that I can picture like a full head of like gray hair and they Storm look- from X Men. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, that's not a real yeah. person, right? Or is it Rogue? She had that one like yeah. in the front. Yeah. Some people, some people, it looks well with their complexion. They pull it off and it looks good. I mean, shit. Obviously, there's there, we went through this trend, or we're still going through this trend of men and women dying, young men and women dying their hair. So, I know and, that's true. Yeah, yeah which you know the older generation is looking at them like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I, so I <laughs> we've been avoiding that right. color. There was this woman that worked out at one of the gyms that I managed years ago, and she was. I think she was in her 60s. She was very fit. She had long gray hair, but it was long, so it wasn't short. So she kind of like it, like young girl hair in terms of the length, but it was all gray. She was very fit. And she was like probably the first woman I ever found truly sexy at that age. And I was, at the time, I was 20, maybe 22, 23 years old, and maybe 20, even younger, maybe even 21. And this older woman, 67 years old, fit with all gray hair and all the guys in the gym were just like, dang, she's hot. And so from that day forward, I think I found gray. I told Jessica, I said, if your hair ever starts to turn gray, like don't, like don't color it, leave it. I well, think it'll look speaking good. of getting old and dying, did you guys talk about health IQ before I got here? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> huh? I better do my health IQ uh, commercial. Listen, yeah. if you're fit, so this go. Is, so here's a commercial. If the, if we you, worked this out before. If these right? two oh, you guys did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you fall within the next the parameters I'm about to tell you, then this applies to you, okay? So if you're somebody that's concerned about being healthy and fit, and you're going to die at some point, yeah, you should go to Health I mean, IQ. You could fit in that uh, demographic. And get life insurance. They specialize in life insurance for fit and healthy people who at some point will die. So yeah. basically, that's everybody. Right. And, and Doug actually compared this to like other... Comp- so it's not like just, just these... Because you know, there's some of these, these companies that I think uh, use things like this as a gimmick, but then you start comparing them to other other companies that they just... They blow them away because they're better deals. Well, they specialize in... Uh, fit and healthy people and the way health insurance works or the way insurance works in general is insurance companies have to the way the reason why you have prices for insurance is because or the, the the reason why there are particular prices is they look at all their risks and they and because insurance companies compete they're all trying to look at risks and try to figure out how they can make a profit and then what constitutes that profit is how they compete so like one insurance company, mm-hmm will figure the risks based on the people who buy their insurance. And they'll say, okay, if we charge an average of $50 a month, we know we'll make a 5% profit. Yeah. And then the next competitor says, okay, if we fi- figure out these risks, we will, we're will we willing to make a 3% profit because we know we're going to get more customers because we're cheaper. And this is how they compete. Well, it only makes sense to really bank on healthy people, right? And so, well, be inter- what I'd be interested to see is someone who who would take this test that's not healthy and see how if it w- actually would make that big of a difference for them or well, it still would be good. Yeah, think a about, di- difference. Yeah, think about all the medication, the visits, No, I mean, for example, yeah. if somebody's a smoker, watch your rates go through the ceiling. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I mean, so obviously in general they would. I'm curious to, let's say a, a smoker or a really out of shape person did the health IQ, mm. would they get still a better rate than if they were to just go to some random insurance company? I think, I don't know what the answer is, but I would assume, and this is total speculation, that because health IQ specializes in fit and healthy people, they may not have the best rates for you right, if you're super unhealthy. That's what I would speculate, but yeah. I don't know. Because be they're banking on a large populace of, of customers who are fit and healthy. Here's some interesting so statistics. So if you're, if you're really out of shape and you smoke cigarettes, I'd love for you to take this and give it feedback. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just, just here, yeah. purely out of curiosity. Yeah. It may not benefit you, but it, and it will benefit I can give you the answer, though. You're going to pay a lot more money if you're unhealthy. Yeah, guaranteed period. because you're going to go through an exam. Yeah, but Doug, I want to know if it's crawl all when up you compared you. this stuff, you compared it to some of the the top other insurance companies out there, and it was what did you say five to fifteen percent lower, right? On yeah, all of them? I compared with two other companies I work with, and I did super preferred rates, and they were actually I think twelve to fifteen or yeah, seventeen percent like, right. less, which is excellent. Uh, and here's the thing, you know, these insurance companies have these mortality tables. So they're they basically figured out 
We when are people, of death. When people are going to die. Yep. So that's how they know how they they can make a profit. But so, there's other factors that come into play too, which has to do with the profitability of the company or the mortality experience of the company. So for example, if a company pays out a lot of claims or if they have high expenses, they have to raise their rates. then they can't have this low of rates. So what Health IQ can do as an agency, they can go out to all these different companies and they can get the lowest rate. So the company that maybe has the best mortality experience, the company that has the lowest expenses, now they can offer lower price insurance. My goal is to fuck all my insurance companies. What? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I'll tell you how you fuck the life insurance company. Stay alive. Die. No, that no, that isn't. Yeah, that, it's no, true. That's true. You die. Now they have to pay. Wow. They have to pay. Yeah. Well, that's a good. Did point. you put me in Justin? As I don't want to advertise. Yeah, that. yeah, I don't want to fuck them. <laughs> that's you, a good point. Well, yeah. here's the thing. That was a brain fart and a half you, on that. I know. <laughs> like I think, <laughs> I'm thinking of like, let's go through my head. It's all my other insurance that I pay yeah. for. You don't know, get your your Backfire. home insurance, your car insurance, all that yeah. stuff. You don't ever cash out any of that shit. Yeah. You get fucked on all that so, stuff. So you know what? Here's a good example. Oh, by the way. By the way, since I did make that fuck up and we're talking about other insurance, there's a company now, which I would love to look into. I forgot the name of them. I screenshotted them, so I'll look them up, uh, that uh, they do it. Um, your insurance is literally like it's every month it's adjusted based off of how much you drove. And mm. obviously, if you got tickets or didn't get, so it's always brilliant. moving. Yeah, and so it's it's huh. it, it tracks your 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 mileage. That's brilliant. Yeah, in that vehicle, and then it adjusted every month according to what where what you're doing. I, I saw a company cool. that had that. It was like a little box that you put. Yes. Yeah, in your car. Yeah. What they're trying to do is they're trying and to and your speed, all your stuff is getting monitored, right? Yeah, because you have to. That's brilliant. Huh. So, like, I'll give you guys an example. Uh, car insurance. Car insurance is more expensive for men than it is for women. And it's not because of sexism, although if we wanted to be, you know, be assholes, we could say that. The truth is men get in more fatal accidents, more likely to get tickets and all that other stuff. But if, it, if, it, speed. if a car insurance company wanted to offer cheaper prices, something they could do is they could say, we will only cover women. Now, because they're, they're, the, the pool of people that they're pulling from are women, and women tend to generally be safer drivers, they can offer cheaper rates to these women. Versus when they do co-ed, they have to, you know, the prices they give to women kind of have to pay for the the more of the men and they're competing in that sense. So Health IQ is trying to get a bunch of healthy people. And as a result of their pool of people being mostly fit and healthy, they can charge uh, lower prices. Is that stat still true that women technically, I know that was yeah. an old stat that, that they technically are, are they're less of a liability because they're, than men are that were more reckless. I thought that was debunked. Oh no, you're if well if you get. Um, I thought Asian people were worse than everybody else. No, so no, that's, that's actually no, no, <laughs> it's a little bit of a stereotype. Yeah, it's a just, little, a little bit. just a little bit, just you a know, little bit. Female <laughs> life insurance costs though are less than male. Yeah, because yeah. women are expected to live longer. Yeah, you know that what's funny? Like your poop theory. Yeah, Adam. this is some this is <laughs> this is some sexism we don't talk about. We got to pay more for that shit. Come yeah. on, man. Come yeah, on, come on, dude. Yeah, you know why we died earlier? By the way. Because we want to. Because <laughs> we want to. We want to get out of here. <laughs> but I did my time. By about 65, we're over this yeah, shit. Stop, uh, na stop uh, nagging me. Worked myself to death. <laughs> Just trying to hit all the- Holy shit. Let's see how offensive we can get. Adam hit the- <laughs> This feels like a, a Married with Children episode. Adam made just some race, racist comments. I made some gender co comments, some sexist comments. How far can we go today? Uh, yeah, in well, today's- Touching them third rails. In today's- Press the button. What do, we, so what do we got, Doug? What do we got trigger. going on today? Yeah. Oh, you know what? Uh, I- so I gave, I did the gold juice last night and I had my kids try a little bit Yeah, and they went to sleep so nice. God, you're little, pushing supplements on your kids two, already. Turmeric yeah. and, uh, yeah. and uh, reishi. It go, I had them try a little bit of that and a little whiskey. Right to sleep. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I can't say for sure if it was the gold juice or the whiskey. And you didn't tease it out. But it was one of those two that, that, that did it. No, what? no, all joking aside. Uh, I did have them taste it. They didn't drink a lot of it. Are you the type of person? They loved it. Are you the type of person that would even consider mixing that with alcohol? I remember early on, early trainer days. A long time ago, I might have. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I remember early trainer days. That Ooh, was kind of- This kinda, would be good with vodka. Right. It was like when you, you would still drink on the weekends and then you'd be a trainer all during the week and healthy, right? And so <laughs> you and you would make mixers. You so, got like a protein yeah. shake <laughs> yes, with Kahlua. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, so, this is a great idea. I did stuff Blah. like that. Did you never do that? I did. So okay, yeah. See? There's a branch chain amino acid. V8 acids. with some fucking vodka so in there. <laughs> there's this yeah. one. I used to drink this yeah, branch Mary chain amino acid supplement called called Extend. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it. 
It's I know what extends is. Yeah. It's a little pills. No, like not extends, those. not boner pills. <laughs> I got that at the extend. truck stop. It's uh, it's amino acid supplement and it's totally artificial, but it tastes really good. But it's, it's probably bad for you. And I'd make uh, mixed drinks with it, and it would color the drink like green or red, and taste like watermelon or fucking, you know, <laughs> apple or whatever. And I'm like, hey, no sugar, it's really good for you. And then you know, we get diarrhea. <laughs> Oh, and, shit. But we don't know why. We don't know why. We didn't know why we got that. Hey, did you guys get the yeah. shirts? The new shirts that just came in. Justin just. Uh, yeah. I didn't get one. You guys oh. never give me shirts. You just, Justin, you just released the stay authentic one, right? So I we did. had the stay authentic one, and then what was the other one that we just had? <sighs> so, you had all three colorways too. I saw red. Yeah. I saw, so we, we launched it this time with all three colors. Last time I kind of split it off with the black and white for the uh, podcasting hard T-shirts. So uh, yeah, so we just. We just launched um, the Stay Authentic shirts, which have kind of the Mad Mike on there, and it's it's got our nice uh, branded logo look to it, and uh, you can get it in red, black, and, and gray. So Somebody told me that on the website it says 2017, but the shirts actually say 2018. So just- Okay, so it's the wrong image on the um, on the website, but yeah, we, we fixed that before we printed them, so oh, okay. it says 2018. Yeah, I, I've seen the actual shirt. The shirt's got the right... So they're yeah, not, they're not it, retro. it's current. You yeah. know what I mean? This isn't a throwback. <laughs> so They were being made in 2017. Yeah, That's yeah. why that was what's going it's on. It's funny. How long does it take before something that is just old becomes cool you know what i mean is there a period of time that like here, here's why i'm asking that remember how i told you guys that i got picked up for that distillery tour in that 1985 right, right. limo it was cool because it was 1985 right right if it was 1995 it would have just been old i feel like it takes a, a, a solid mm-hmm. a is solid like 30 years yeah i would say a solid 20 to 30 years 20 minimum probably 30 years because when you look at fashion right a lot of the stuff that we see right now the trends that are like super popular I remember that as a young kid. So those a lot of those were like or similar. Like they're just like extensions yeah. of it. Like it's like, well, we didn't exactly have skinny jeans, but we had fitted tapered jeans that we used to tight roll. So you get kind of the right. same look, right? So even though we didn't have technically quote unquote skinny jeans, we had jeans that were pretty much like stonewash really. And big. do you think everything like makes a, a resurrection again? Or because no. like there's no. some fashions that like are real popular and you're like how the fuck did we ever like no there's agree definitely to this yeah. I, I think that i saw i saw a special yeah, so like when's remember. the cravat gonna come they've back done, they've done they've done when's some the mc hammer pants coming back they've That's done some things where they've done a uh, specials i've seen where they, they talk about and they talk about styles that like have came back or that were great or that it died off and like don't ever come back again like there's definitely trends that that stay gone for yeah. for good and yeah. i you know right now i feel like the generation now is taken two or three generations and kind of fucking threw it all together because yeah. there's this they're there's, trying to outdo each other with the eclectic ideas yeah because there's definitely some things i see from the 80s and there's some things i see from the 90s right so i see some some of the the stonewash the tapering this reminds me of like the 80s and then there's the this the kick of the neon bright colors and stuff again neon bright colored sunglasses they went on that kick a little bit right that was all 90s stuff 90s it was cool to wear all these Vibrant, bright neon colors all the time. Yeah, oh, the uh, gotcha shirts, all yeah. that shit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting Ocean for the Pacific gotcha. I'm yeah. waiting for the big jeans, Ocean man. Jinko, big old, yeah, the, the big Jinko. old. They were so dumb. No, like, you don't yeah, think so? No, those I mean, if people bring those back, uh, they're just being assholes. Yeah. I do, I do believe that the tapered, the do, the tapered skinny jean thing will will die off, and we will see baggy again, or at least loose fit come <laughs> back again. Because that's a, I, the one thing that's been nice about yeah, me. It's more comfortable. You know, falling into depression, low testosterone, and all the misery I'm going through right now is that my, my legs have <laughs> shrunk to nothing. And so I fit in these nice little skinny jeans now. Like, <laughs> so I actually, I can, I can wear some of these clothes that like are in style right now. But when I'm in shape, dude, and I actually have legs on me and a frame on me. Are you doing like hip extension stuff? Because your glutes look all right. They don't look like they're <laughs> wearing at all. Wow, so. We were, what? That's just yeah. good genetics. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, they don't look like they've atrophied at all. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Doug were talking about it earlier. Them, yeah. <laughs> this, Doug's Keep, always talking about my keeping ass. Keeping them glutes <laughs> strong. Tight. All right. Bring on the bird. Today's Quaw is being brought to you by Chimera Coffee. It's the only coffee that is infused with all natural nootropics for a cleaner, calmer, and more focused buzz without the crash. Click the Chimera link at mindpumpmedia.com and input the discount code MINDPUMP at checkout for 10% off. It's the motherfucking Quaw. The eagle has landed. Quaw. First question is from B.W. Lawson. 
1973. What is the real benefit of stopping two reps short before failure? Good question. It Ooh. is. So first, let's define right. failure. Uh, when you're lifting weights, failure is when you cannot perform Perfect a, rep. another good, yeah. clean repetition. So that's number one. I have to define that because I think sometimes people think failure means... You just can't move the bar anymore. Yeah, you can't even like lift it off. Yeah. I, and I don't think people realize how important this point is too because as soon as the form breaks down, just because you get the rep up doesn't necessarily mean that's a good idea. And I think some people, and this is a confusion of reading studies of going to failure and the extra benefits you might get for building more muscle. The, the, the extra benefits you might get from pushing yourself to failure, I think is negated by the poor patterning that you're going to create by forcing a rep out. Yeah. So it's really, uh, there's really a fine line in my opinion on this people training to failure all the time. It, it is a tool. It can be used, mm -hmm. but for the, mo I think it's abused and overused. Yeah. And more often than not, you should be training like this where it's two reps. Yeah, more often than not, it, it just feels counterproductive, right? Cause then, then I'm trying to, to actually heal as opposed to, you know, full, like I fully recover and then, um, you know, move forward. Whereas, like if, if I stop myself with just enough kind of left in the tank, then, you know, me to be able to keep building and building on top of that and consistently training, uh, like I, I move forward, man. Mm -hmm. It's just, it, it's, it's momentum that, that moves forward versus, okay, push, pull, push, pull, you know, that, that kind of a mentality where now I have to kind of force myself, uh, into recovery. This was when I think of all the game changer, like singular, um, you know, techniques that I changed uh, through my resistance training career and my personal training career, um, stopping a couple reps before failure is up there. It's probably, I would agree it might that. be number one or number two. It was that big of a difference. I, I agree with that, but I think there's a reason why that is too. I think it's because we fell in that category. I mean, when you go back and you even watch like the old like Arnold videos yeah. and stuff like that, these guys are, come on, three more, yeah. three more, you pussy. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that, that's that been ingrained in, our, in the culture of bodybuilding and lifting. And so, you know, as a young teenage boy who was reading these magazines and watching, you know, uh, Arnold and shit like you're going like oh, this is how I gotta train oh, yeah. I gotta train this way and that's mm -hmm. how you get big and that was so no I mean when I first did this uh, so I'll, I'll tell you what led up to this I was reading um, Kubrick's uh, book uh, Dinosaur Training and he was talking about how he would do how you know these strong men and athletes and uh, back in the day would do all these you know lifts and they do them frequently and I remember thinking, like, how the hell can you recover from doing right. these lifts so frequently? Like, how is that even possible? How does that even work? And then I started thinking about all of the, you know, strong, muscular men in my family who don't even lift weights and just from being physical at work. And I would think to myself, like, well, none of them are doing any of that shit to failure. Like, you know, my dad, who was a stone worker for, you know, decades since he was nine years old, he's not going to failure at work. He does it all the time. By this point... It's not super strenuous in that particular sense, but this guy had my dad's hands are made out of like they're like concrete, and his forearms are muscular, and his shoulders were strong. And I started thinking like, well, is it really necessary to go to failure? And so I started stopping my repetitions uh, short of failure. And oh, the other thing too is uh, observing Olympic lifters. Olympic lifters mm -hmm. don't go to failure except for maybe the day of competition. Yeah, competing. They never go to failure. Well, they save it all for that. So what I started doing in my training is I didn't change anything else at this point. All I did was that I stopped two reps short of failure, and literally the following week I was stronger. It was like, boom, right away. Yeah, it was a big game. It was, I got stronger right away. Then I started recommending it to my friends who lifted weights, and I would tell them, hey, don't change your routine. Just try this. Don't go to failure. Stop like one or two reps short of it. And every single one of them contacted me afterwards and was like, dude, I'm like, building more muscle and I'm stronger right away. Now, the science supports this 100%. They've actually studied this and tested this. And most studies will show that when you compare groups of individuals, uh, all things being equal, going to failure not only is not necessary or not more beneficial, but in many cases is less beneficial where the person doesn't advance as quickly. Now, there's a lot of theories as to why. Like, what's going on? Is it because of the additional muscle damage? Probably not. I don't think it's necessarily the additional muscle damage. I think it's the hammering of the central nervous system that uh, is the problem because when you're reaching down deep to take your body to momentary muscular failure, 
you are calling upon your CNS to to really give you every single bit of juice that it has. And once the CNS gets really fatigued, it takes much longer to recover than muscle. Um, we know this. Uh, muscles recover pretty quickly in comparison to the central nervous system. Um, the rest of your sets tend to get uh, hampered quite a bit. So you've got to reduce your volume and your frequency, which are both important factors. And then you just don't get uh, as good of results. Now, does this mean you should never go to failure? I don't think so. I think well, every once in a while it's okay. Yeah, and then like I, I almost used it as a coach, even and in, in for myself, uh, once I started applying this um, as more of a quarterly sort of gauge. So like as far as like the effectiveness of my training and you know how I've been able to kind of build up to a new standard and, and something that I've I've stretched the the limitations that I currently had. Uh, whether that was physically or whether that was mentally, sometimes you know you you have a stuck sort of of mentality when it comes to load or when it comes to your actual abilities. To where I do feel it's important to stretch your abilities, to to press them, to challenge yourself. But then you know going through that like failure uh, testing. I mean, we took days off. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, for recovery and just kind of coming back to now approaching, um, you know, starting the whole process all over again. Yeah. It, I, it, it goes back to what I've said on the show a bunch of times, which is you're, you're, it's always for the people that, that don't need to do it are doing it too much. The people, yeah. the, you know, and the people that are doing it too much would benefit the most by not doing it. Right. So if you're, if you're somebody who's listening to this right now and because there, there's another, there's lots of different people that I would give different advice to when speaking to something like this, right? So Definitely. if I have a client or I have a person who rarely ever trains to failure or is scared to train to failure because they, they don't want to fail or they don't know what that they're, they're afraid to drop the weight on themselves. And they, so then they, they rarely ever even push to failure and they train like that, getting them to go to failure actually will probably show lots of benefits uh, for their body and as far as building muscle is mm -hmm. concerned. Now, we speak like the way it affected us because, like I was saying earlier, that you know I was in, impacted by the magazines and by what I was seeing, like Arnold training. And so in my head, I thought, like, this is how I yeah, need to train. Yeah, we were totally sucked into the right. ego of it and the culture. So, I mean, set one, dude. Yeah. Set one. I'm, I'm, I'm pressing up. Every the, set. Every set. Every yeah. set was to failure. And I always wanted a spotter, and I trained that way. Now, as I got older, wiser – and learned a lot more. Uh, I remember, I remember like the light bulb going off when I started to go two reps short of failure. Just like you, Sal, I started to see these huge strength gains, like really quick. I was like, "Whoa, this is nuts!" Mm -hmm. I'm not pushing as hard in the gym, but yet, it, or it felt like I wasn't pushing as hard in the gym, but yet I, I was seeing gains really quick. And so, I think that really was because of the fact that I was so extreme on the other the other side of this. Now, what I saw in the competitive world that I think is really funny, and I think this hurts a lot of the bodybuilders, bikini athletes that I saw, my peers, is because these guys and girls, they, they go to failure on almost every exercise, and many of them don't, have, don't understand order of operation as far as what exercises to do first. So you've got these guys, and I would die laughing. I'm like, you start off on the pec deck machine, doing flies and you go to failure and it's like then you go over to go do like some dumbbell presses or do some bench press and like you're already your cns is fried you've already fatigued the muscle and so you're lifting probably 60 70 percent of your 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 max of what you could do if that and you're not really getting the best bang for your buck for the best exercise you possibly could so if yeah. i was going to if i'm going to failure now i'm going to do it on my last set of my compound lift Whatever the big whatever the big lift is that I that I think I'm gonna get the biggest bang for my buck, I at the very last set and the very last set or very last exercise, so last exercise and last set of that muscle group that I might be working on mm -hmm. and and the compound lift, I, I'm gonna maybe push to failure. Yeah, what you have to understand is when you're training uh, your body to build muscle, it's this uh, it's really this delicate dance between sending a a signal and a, a stimulus for muscle growth versus my body's ability to recover and repair. And you have to balance those two out. It's, they, they're both intricately connected. If you had this limitless recovery ability, this ability to just recover and repair both your central nervous system and your muscle very easily, then just more intensity would always be better. You, you could always just throw 
more and more at your body because you're recovery. You don't have to worry about. Well, talk about what the signal you're sending when you're doing that is durability. Yeah. Like if you do go to failure all the time, like I'm not saying that you're not going to be badass at lifting weights. And CrossFit's a great example of that. Yeah. Like it doesn't mean that you're not going to become badass at lifting weights in there. But if we're chasing change in our body, then then it's not the ideal I, path. I would even argue uh, you might not make you badass. I think if you keep pushing that, you're you're going to start to get negative effects as you overcome your body's ability to adapt and recover. And so you have to understand that. So does going to failure cause a larger or louder muscle building signal or stimulus than not going to failure? Technically, it does. Technically, yes. If we're to measure all of the the things that we know how to measure that show that they, you know, muscle damage and signaling. Oh, oh no doubt. If yeah. you took two groups of people that have never, like, no one's lifted, especially a short period, you know, of or time. say everyone's lifted exactly the same amount of years under their belt, and you took two groups and you said, you never trained to failure. This group always trained to failure. We watch it for six weeks. The ones that in six weeks are going to show that went to failure are going to show more progress. Well, they, well, what they'll show is, and what I mean is, is when you can measure things like uh, you know muscle damage, markers of damage, and protein synthesis and all that, failure sends a louder signal, but it overcomes your ability to recover too much to make up for it. So right. you might get a little bit more benefit from doing those extra two reps, but because it overcomes your ability to recover so much, not only is it not worth it, but for most people it's detrimental. And so this is why we can make a blanket statement for most people and say, you're probably better off stopping about two reps short of failure. For most people, if you do that most of the time, you'll get way better results than if you push yourself uh, to failure with your workouts. And we can say that confidently because of both our experience and because of literature totally well, supports Well, and I it. think that all of us as, as trainers, the, the last the last variable that I tend to manipulate is intensity. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm going to play I'm gonna play with exercise, diet, movement. I'm going to mess with a lot of different variables. Well, the I, last you, one I'm fucking with is intensity. Yeah, the, I mean, you just kind of feel the difference between when you're forcing your body and when you're actually working with your body. And this is like another clear example of that to me of when I feel like, you know, if I'm I'm pressing too hard towards failure and I have to recover harder. I'm really like forcing it. I'm, mm. and, and, and it, it never like, you just don't have the same type of energy and drive when you're really forcing your body yeah, to, to, to do something. I'll tell you what, I could take a big, a total deconditioned beginner and I could train them every single day. If I appropriately, uh, modify their intensity and the duration of the workout and all that stuff, I could also take, a complete beginner who's never worked out, and with one set, with one set, I could fuck them up really, really bad. Oh, yeah. That's what intensity can do. Intensity has that much power over your body's ability to recover, whereas it, frequency and volume, you know, you can manipulate those, and those both also have an impact, but it's intensity you got to be most care careful for because one set too hard, even mm -hmm. somebody, I'll tell you what, I don't, even if you're super experienced, I bet I could take someone who's super experienced and I could take them through, I can invent a set and take them through where we're doing super crazy to failure, strip set, negatives, partials, you know, uh, and now isometrics at the end. And I'll fuck you up. I'll go beyond your body's ability to recover. Yeah. That's the power of intensity. The problem and is the culture's got to change. Yeah. The, culture, the culture has to change because it's still... We still have this mentality of okay, uh, if I if the sore I am, the better the workout is. People still believe that, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I'll be the first to admit that I was somebody who was like this, where I measured my workouts, the success of my workouts, how I fucking felt the next day, yeah. Yeah. and not how good I felt or how much energy I had or how much mobility or how, but how sore I was. And the more sore I was, like, oh yeah, yeah I got it good. good workout. It was yeah, a good dude. workout. I got it good. Where I have a, such a different outlook on it now now when i feel that sore, i'm like fuck i did way more than i needed to <laughs> yeah. that's exactly what goes through my head if i if i am sore like really sore like sort of the touch poked my chest and i'm like oh that to me goes like what an idiot i did way more than i needed to do yeah. to elicit some sort of change in my body and that is the goal and i think when you start to switch your mentality that okay it's no longer this how sore can i get and that's the measure it's of not the about organ. the mo how, what's the most i could do it's about what's the least i could do right that's it it's that's a that's a very so, a so, yeah, so the sh so the the sore feeling should not be a pat yourself on the back you did such a great workout the other day it should be like shit i didn't have to yeah. do that much to get the change that i was looking which for which is a crazy hard mental discipline to establish right it's especially an especially for yeah well when you, when you're indoctrinated in this this mentality of like kill every workout and and you know crush crush everything 
everything you do uh, to really train with discipline and and be smart about it. it it's challenging. Man. Well, and I want to point out too that we, when we talk on Mind Pump, like we we're a, a lot of what we talk about comes from our experience of training thousands of normal average people. Okay, so I'm not speaking to the men's physique or the bodybuilder right. guy who's been training for 15 Who can years cover with artificial uh, right, testosterone right right yeah. totally different like I, I trained like a madman when i was competing i train nowhere near at the volume uh right now as what i was when i was competing it was a whole nother level and breaking a lot of the rules that we talk about right now but the, the bottom line is most of you are not that person and even if you want to be that person there's a lot of scaling that needs to happen between where you're at now and there, and you want to leave as many tools in your tool belt as you can, and intensity is a great tool, but it's one of the most abused tools, and it's the one that you want to save, man. It's the one you want to have in your back pocket because you know you can always ramp up the intensity. Like, I want to dial in the nutrition. I want to dial in my steps. I want to dial in my program design. I want to dial all that in, and then when I want to bump to the next level, I'll add some intensity mm -hmm. in there. Next question is from Harriet Edwards 410. Why is it that when I'm sick, I crave shitty food like white toast and crackers? The thought of healthy foods or vegetables makes me nauseous and is the last thing my body wants. Everyone I know is the same. Yep, me too. I don't know about you guys. When you're sick, don't you just feel like you want to eat? Carbs and fat. Yeah, you know? like uh, you know, Doritos or fried garbage. Fries, <laughs> fri yeah. French fries, fried food and carbohydrates, man. Yeah. Sugar, sugar and fat. So, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna speculate on on why this is. And I've actually thought about this myself uh, when I was sick because this is this is kind of this is common. I think a lot of people experience this. So first off, there's there's a little clue in the way that this person asked the question, which is they said that they crave these types of foods. So, so we need to uh, we have to differentiate between crave and hunger. Cravings are very different. So, if I'm if you think you're hungry, if you're truly hungry, pretty much any food that's going to be in front of you, you're going to want to eat. When you're craving something, it's more like you know when your friend says, "Oh my God, I'm starving," and you say, "Oh cool, do you want to go eat over here?" And they go, "Nah, I'm not really in the mood for that." What about this? Nah, I'm not in the mood for that. But you know, it sounds good, tacos or something like that. That's not hunger. Uh, that's a craving and it's very, very different. It's not necessarily what your body wants uh, it, from a hunger perspective. It's what your total being may want based off of your emotion, the environment you're in, your your mood, like all these different things. And cravings are influenced by all of those types of things. I've, I use the example of the movie theater and popcorn a lot because it's an easy one for people to understand that you'll crave popcorn most likely when you're in a movie theater because you've been conditioned to do so. Now, why is it that when you're sick, you're, you don't want to eat healthy foods? Well, healthy foods are, and we're going to, let's uh, define that for a second. I'm going to assume that this person's talking about foods that are whole and natural in their, in their state. So, you know, if I'm going to eat like a piece of fish or vegetables or just minimally processed foods, that's what I think they're referring to. Why would uh, those types of foods, sorry, those types of foods, are the foods we evolved with, and those are the types of foods that our bodies are going to be most accurate with in terms of our signaling. So if I'm going to eat whole natural foods, my body's natural systems of satiety are more likely to kick in when I'm eating, the, eating those foods in more accurate ways than if I'm eating foods that are not whole and natural. When you're sick, your body may be telling you it's a good idea to not eat. That's just the bottom line. And the reason why you're not craving or want to eat quote unquote healthy foods is because your body probably just doesn't want to eat. And studies will show that the old adage, you know, what do they say? Starve a fever, feed a cold, or I'm not quite sure which one is the reverse. Mm. But in one of those cases, and I believe it's viral infections, and you're going to have to double check and look it up yourself. I believe it's viral infections, but animal studies show that uh, when animals have a viral infection and they fast, they're like, like they heal faster. When they have a bacterial infection, they tend to, and they eat, they tend to. I'm sorry, it's the reverse. When they starve a bacterial infection, I believe they heal faster. And when they feed a virus, they tend to do better. So mm. it could be that your body's just telling you to not eat, and you sh you might want uh, to listen to it. And the reason why you end up craving shitty foods or processed foods is because those foods were designed and engineered to overcome or hijack your body's natural systems. So you're more likely to want to eat those foods because they're hyper palatable. 
you know, these foods hit on all these different sensors well, in your body. I, I also think there's a behavioral piece that goes e- in. Emotional, it, right? Yes. When you're, you don't feel good and you're, you're laying around watching TV and stuff like that. And I, I mean, I know from my own habits and patterns that it's like a comfort thing. Yeah. yeah. When I'm watching, when I'm lazy or don't feel good and watching TV, you know, a cheeseburger and French fries or that type of food <coughs> is more appealing to me. And it's not because that's what my body is trying to tell me it wants or needs. It's that's just behavioral addiction that I've uh, have done this for so many years that, that when I'm lazy or doing these things, I eat that just like the popcorn analogy you gave. When I go to the gym, I'm working out and I feel ha- healthy. I tend to gravitate towards healthier foods because I feel good about my, I feel good. I'm taking care of my body and I want to continue this episode. So I tend to quote unquote crave the the healthier type food. So I believe there's some there's uh, a lot of uh, behavioral stuff or psychological things that are going on with you too when we want these things because it, it's not that it's the white crackers I think are, are very beneficial and so that's why you want them. I think there's some behavioral addiction that you're battling also in addition to what Sal's talking mm-hmm. about. So I think it's a, it's a, it's Oh, a, here it is. So it's, it was a study on mice and it found, so they did it with mice. They gave them listeria. And when they gave them listeria, the mice stopped eating, which is common. You know, if you got a food poisoning or whatever, you don't want to eat anymore. And they made a full recovery. But the, when they had mice that were infected with, uh, with mono and they were force fed, they, oh, excuse me, the same, uh, bacteria listeria and they force fed them. They died. So they found that, you know, forcing yourself to eat in particular situations with animals might not be a good thing, and sometimes it's well, a good idea. Sal, to doesn't doesn't a cold affect to our palate because it, you've got this mucus buildup and you've got all this stuff going on in your mouth and your throat? Like, doesn't it even affect our? I would think that it would affect our palate too, and so maybe foods that are more bland and don't, and don't have that are less desirable. And so it you want be. something that's... I mean, it could be, right? It's all speculation, but this is the best... The, the, this animal study is the best study that we have to show because it's 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 not ethical to test this on humans, right? You can't... Mm-hmm. I, I don't think they'd be able to get funding or approval to take a group of people who are sick with the virus and bacteria and either you know starve them or force feed them to see what would happen. But they did do it in animals and... Uh, viral infections, when people were, when the animals were fed with viral infections, they survived better. And when they were fasted with a bacterial infection, they survived better. So the whole, you know, uh, feed a, feed a cold, starve a fever, I think it is, uh, is, yeah. is somewhat accurate in this particular sense. So I really think it's your body just talking to you. And these highly processed palatable, palatable foods, they override your body's systems all the time, including when you're sick. I know, I mean, a good example is this. Like, how many, t- how many times have you eaten a big meal and you're stuffed and then they bring out a sugary dessert and all of a sudden, like magically, I can eat more. You can physically feel that you're stuffed. Like physically, like my stomach hurts. It's too full. Just the novelty of it will yeah, change it's, your, your entire like feeling for that. You've overcome what they call palate fatigue. And I think when you're sick, depending on your type of illness that you have, your body's telling you, you know, probably better off not eating at this moment and uh in this particular case that's you know in the, in the animal study that seems to be the case but the emotional component like you were talking about adam I, I fully agree with because i know that there are comfort foods that i have that maybe my mom gave me or whatever that i grew up with when i was sick and just making me feel emotionally better oh the uh, only time things. i ever want a big mac and french fries is when i'm sick yeah and it's because i know that I exact ate, meal that it's exact probably meal. like an association the you only created, the, yeah, no it is 100 yeah. percent for my that and and i want seven up i never drink seven up and i never yeah. have mcdonald's and, <laughs> oh but, but, my grandma for so many me, yeah so like many your saltine crackers in seven up was the thing you know like, you know where did that and, come and peanut from? butter yeah, yeah uh, for some reason peanut butter yeah peanut butter saltine crackers in like seven up it's like oh so cure everything yeah seven up was like the the cure for all stomach ailments there's a there's a reason behind it. it has something to do with the That's carbonation. Marketing. Has to be the carbonation. No, there, there, there's some benefits. There's some, there's something. There, I know there's something to that and the saltine crackers. And I think the saltine crackers has something to do with sodium. And I think, I, I think the uh, carbonation has something to do with the Seven Up. Now I know ginger ale. Yeah. Uh, has been recommended for people with nausea and stuff like that. But that's if it's made with real ginger. Yeah. Because ginger has yeah. anti-nausea. Yeah, I'm yeah. 100% yeah. I'm speculating right now. But I, I'm almost certain that I've read that somewhere. Almost certain, right? Well, I, I, What's I, that? What do you call that when you say something? When you're stupid? almost certain. Maybe she just yeah. got it wrong and was supposed to give me no, ginger that's like ale. A, yeah. just, just pretend like you're Ox, certain, bro. It's like, a, it's like an oxymoron. Yeah, just pretend right? like you're My dad used to say that. I'm almost, I'm almost positive. I'm like, what the fuck does almost positive <laughs> mean? That's an oxymoron, isn't it? Like No, you're not, actually. Doug, you've been shopping for vacuums? 
Yeah, when he pulls up, when he pulls up the stats, I know. You, you know, it's kind of crazy when you think about that now. Like, it's kind of a giveaway on what you've been looking at lately. So yeah. <laughs> you say you got your wife in yeah, there. I saw, I saw a real. Who's sexy been looking one? at the yeah. strap-ons? <laughs> Dyson is pretty hot. Uh, yeah. getting, getting crazy. It was a uh, the Dyson uh, penis pump. That was a good one. Yeah, they should make that. <laughs> They're really good at uh, <laughs> suction. <laughs> Next question is from Spam, Rice, and Eggs. Spam, Rice, and Eggs. Yeah, great combo. Why exactly do some of the exercises in Prime Pro make us cramp? Ooh, good question. This is a great <laughs> oh, question yeah. because when- uh, doctor, It does happen, when, for sure. When Dr. Brink was taking us through how to apply these movements, um, we were cramping like crazy, and he, he told us- to push through the yeah, cramp. Yeah, drive through it. Which is the exact opposite you of what you want to do. You do not want to do that. So when you want to cramp. So I actually, because of Brink and because of that whole process for us, I actually teach Prime Pro uh, differently to people when that own the program and that I've helped out with that. And I actually tell them, when you do any of these moves, seek the cramp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Push, Keep pushing the range of motion until you find that, because you'll almost find it in almost every move. That's like your threshold. Right, and I think what that, I mean, I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, if it, what's happening is that it, you have all, you're kind of waking up muscles that have just not been activated, and it's the spasming of, of and firing of that. It just hasn't been used to being worked. And it, it hasn't solidified that connection yet. Right, and yeah. so I think, it, I feel like the cramping sensation that we feel is the spasming of the muscle trying to get activated and get get connected. I think it's the CNS uh, trying to find its way because, yeah. you know, think of it this way. When you, when you work a muscle, when a muscle's contracted, acting in a particular range of motion that you have control over. What that means is the central nervous system knows how to fire that muscle effectively and efficiently through that, you know, uh, known range of motion. Now, when you move outside of that range of motion, whether it's in a uh, extended stretch position or in a, you know, what's more common in, in these particular positions in a hyper contracted position or in a new range, just a new range of motion that you're not used to your central nervous system has to find its way to connect to that particular range of motion. Mm -hmm. And when you're calling upon the CNS and you're like trying really hard and you're pushing really hard and you're trying to get that CNS to fire, the CNS is getting the signal from you that says fire. Yeah. It's trying to figure out what to do, so it just fires. Well, And, and you get this cramp. Yeah, you're really trying to override these governing systems that are in place too. So you've, you've just found where where you've established like, okay, this is where we normally go. Well, and if you're 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 now going beyond, uh, you know this this uh, comfort zone that you've established within your daily routines, and so like your body almost has this like reaction to that. So it's like it's it, it it almost freaks the system out on some level. So it's giving you that signal like caution, 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 caution. But you have to kind of own that and control and and ease your way through that. Well, the ironic part though, and that's why I don't know if it's so much that as it is the the CNS trying to get the muscle to fire, to take it through full range of motion. And that's why we get the cramping, spasming type feeling. Because if I took you through that stretch, what I did, and you didn't do it actively, it wouldn't fire, it wouldn't fire and cramp. No. It wouldn't cramp up because you're not required. You're not I asking you're this demand of to take it As far it through. as passively versus now yeah. trying to connect intrinsically. Right. What, what I find really interesting is that there's obviously different types of cramps that we get because- you we've all had the muscle spasm or the cramp out of nowhere where you're not even trying to activate it, right? right. All of a sudden, your calf locks up out of nowhere, yeah. and that sometimes could be a, a lack of a nutrient in yeah. your body. Electrolyte electrolyte imbalance. Right, imbalance. there could be, exactly. So there can be that imbalance going on for that. But this is different. This, this is, is not. Different. This is, is not from that. This is sure. this is you trying to. You know what this reminds me of? Do you guys remember when you first started lifting weights, or maybe after a layoff, like you haven't worked out in a while, and you go to lift a weight, but you're like shaky. Yeah, yeah. You get that. that, that, that that kind uh -huh. of shakiness feeling, that unstable feeling, that's because the CNS, you know, regressed its ability mm -hmm. to control your muscle. And then after a few sets or even after a few workouts, now you're pressing and you're you're moving the weight and it's smooth again. Yeah. So, you know, those of you listening, I'm sure you've experienced that before where you're trying to do an exercise and you just feel shaky within the movement. And that's because you're not connected to that range of motion. This is exactly what's happening with these movements in Prime Pro, and this is a good sign. No, it is. I don't mean it's a good sign in the sense that uh, that you know it's showing you that your body's got great mobility. I mean it's a good sign in the sense that you are you are training your body to work in new ranges of motion, and that cramping is a signal to tell you, 
hey, man, you're in a different range of motion. This is a new connection that we're starting to build. Yeah. That's how you know Prime Pro is so fucking badass is when you get in these positions and if you apply them properly, you're going to get some cramping, but over time, and it's actually quite short. Like mm -hmm. I'll do, uh, you know, I'll practice a Prime Pro repatterning movement and within a few times practicing it, I've got more range of motion and the cramping doesn't happen until later and later on. I well, mean, it happens that fast. Yeah, well, and I w it does happen really fast. And I would venture to even tell people, to challenge people that if you go through Prime Pro and you never cramp, you're not pushing your range of motion. You're not. Ex you're right. probably not getting the max benefits from that because you should be. No matter how already flexible you are, you're, everybody should be challenging their end range of motion through this through prime pro and everything should start cramping and if it's not you're you're just kind of taking it to the which is what i you're think you're just working where you can work yeah, yeah, your comfort yeah zone. And you're not seeing the real benefits from it if you if you push through the cramp like what sal's talking about i, I think you'll notice a difference within a week or two fast oh, yeah. yeah really really quick. fast really, it's really actually quick. it's actually uh i know we call prime pro our, our correctional program which kind of you know gives it the the illusion that it's only for people who have pain or aches and pains. I'll tell you something right now. You do prime if you have no pains and you feel like you're good in the gym or whatever, and you do Prime Pro and you apply it to, you know, parts of your body, whether it's your hips or your feet or your hands or whatever, and just do them right. You know, do them like we explain in the videos. You will notice a significant improvement in your performance just because your CNS is now able well, to connect better. Yeah, just think about like how much more effective like all of your lifts would be if every joint was super stable. You know, and you could just fire them just, well. on command, mm -hmm. you know, and so it's, it's, it's one of those things that, yeah, we don't sell it a lot as like a performance type of a program, but honestly, it, it's one of the best and most effective things you can do as far as from a performance perspective as well. Absolutely. Yeah. You get more connected to those longer, you know, larger ranges of motion. It just gives you a greater ability to. Uh, stimulate muscle growth and to train in, in you better range of motion. You can navigate, you know, mm -hmm. you can navigate in that space, whereas you're uncomfortable for it. So think about that. Like if you end up in a position where you're uncomfortable with it, right? And and now you have to get out of that position and, and drive forces through that position. Well, you know, that's like injury and that's that's like more like more issues that will, will arise because you're just unfamiliar with that feeling. Next question is from Salinas174. Is it beneficial for performance-based individuals to cross-train in different sports or focus on their one sport for maximizing performance? Dude, what another great... Who, had, who got the questions today? Yeah. That, yeah. Who do you think? Sal, Sal got all well, these. Good, quite, good, good questions it's, today, well, it's dude. Well, it's not, it's not me. Sometimes it's people you do, asking them. Well, sometimes you do all the fucking hippie shit that yeah. just drives well, me crazy. This is a this is I, these are these are good questions I right now. These are fire, and, right? and this one is I a, give credit to the people asking the questions. Well, right. hey, you know, no, this is a, you, maybe, yeah, if you, maybe, if you pick, pick, maybe if you pick some questions, then we wouldn't just be relying on me to pick uh, questions all the time. I was just complimenting you, Dick. They're great <laughs> questions right now. So, I this is cool because uh, it depends. Um, if you're, I think, uh, now I think you, if you're a kid, right. So they, they've, they've talked about this or I don't know where, who we interviewed that we, we got into this discussion. Do you guys remember getting into this discussion on the show? You we, know what? Yes, I go, do. It, it, it was, um, was it Andy? Uh, doctor and it was a sports psychologist. Oh, it was a sports psychologist guy. Yeah. 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 Well, what's his name? Who, who, who was it? Brett McCabe. McCabe. There, Brett you McCabe. Go. there you go. Yeah, yeah. It was him who we talked. Yeah, so yeah, because he was talking about that with parents too and how like they were so myopic in, right. in like one sport. Like we're going to dominate this one sport because this is like the new standard, whereas like it really affected the overall performance of the athlete. Right, which you would think, you would think, uh, you know, that that would be ideal, right? Is yeah. to specialize. Totally specialize. Yeah. Specialize in that. But when you're going through those, those early years, you're going to get way more benefit by cross crossing over. Now, fast forward that to somebody who's 30 or 40 year, years, years old, and you're probably going to benefit way more by st honing in on one sport, For sure. becoming a master at that. But there's, as a, as a, as a young child, there's you're so developing many, developing still. Yeah. There's so many things going on neurologically with proprioception and they're just their own body awareness and strength and stability that they're still putting together that having this wide, range or spectrum of sports that you that you play in are going to be benefit you you know swimming and volleyball and basketball and football yes. and wrestling and judo they all have these individual 
benefits that will carry over building this great foundation. Now, once you have that as a young kid moving into being a young a young adult, now becoming more specialized would be more beneficial. Yeah, I couldn't have said that better myself. I mean, when you're when you're young, you're looking at developing general athletic ability mm-hmm. more than. Or at least that is just as important as developing specific uh, athletic ability. As you get older, um, you start to take away from your performance in your chosen sport. Like if you're if you're a, a, a baseball player and you're really good at baseball and you that's your chosen sport, but then you go and devote a bunch of time to playing basketball or powerlifting. I'll use that as a better example because it's more extreme. It's going to take away. They're both going to take away from each other. Whereas when you're a kid, not so much. Now, if your goal is to just maximize overall performance and health, then cross training is ideal because right. it's going to encourage different uh, movement patterns. It's going to uh, discourage what happens when you specialize in a sport, which is uh, you know muscle imbalances and recruitment pattern issues. Where you know I've trained you know, and I'll use another. I'll use kids as an example. I've trained kids who played baseball for, I trade this one guy who was a high school baseball player. He was a senior and he was throwing 90 miles, almost 90 miles an hour at, at, as a senior. Okay. But when I would go, when he came to me and lift weights, cause we started lifting weights cause he was getting all these injuries. His right arm was so much stronger than his left arm. It was silly. He actually had a twist in his spine because mm-hmm. he never, balanced his body out and so now he developed such horrible recruitment patterns Early as a result on. oh yeah. it was terrible like we would do rows yeah. and it was like i could i could cut him in half it was like two different people like this scapula retracts and does a, this one doesn't want to even connect it was really 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 weird and you can you can start to do that if you specialize just in one sport for too long especially as a kid but as you get older i think you know, it makes yeah, there's sense. a shelf life to that. That's a good point, though. That if you know, if you're, what's your goal? Your main goal is like if you just want to be good, at like sport, you want to just be very athletic. Yeah, then there's lots of benefits to all over the place. But if you want to be great at that sport, nothing's going to benefit you more than being practicing your sport yeah. and doing it over and over and over. You know, they did. Um, they there's uh, there was a, a burial site or something that they excavated uh, uh, in the UK in England, I believe, and. It was an ancient Roman burial site, and they pulled the you know the the, the bones out, and they could tell um, that some of the the people that were buried were discus throwers, or they've pulled up bones and said, long "Oh, bow. these are long bowmen." Yeah, and the long bow. So a long bow, uh, you know, in medieval times was a deadly, deadly military weapon. It was a massive bow that required. I think the estimates were. 140 or 170 pounds of pulling strength. Holy with one shit, arm. that's a big deal. And the a reason, 60 pound bow or is a big bow. It to was. Pull. It was. I don't know. Maybe Doug can look it up. Maybe that. Look up the force required to pull a long bow, medieval long bow. It was something ridiculous, but they were devastating because of their distance. So your military could literally just hammer another army f- far away, and they couldn't even touch you. Uh, until they got to a certain distance, and you would just decimate them with these longbowmen. And these men were trained specifically to be able to operate these longbows uh, for as they since they were kids. Now, when they ex- when they pulled the bones out, the spines would be twisted, and their right arms, uh, like their forearms and shoulders, were th- much thicker than their left. They much of they must have looked so strange walking around. Like you must be able to look at them and be like, oh, that's a longbowman, because their bodies literally contorted and twisted and adapted to the to, to to be able to pull on these things. So. Did you guys see uh Joe Rogan's new toy? No. Oh yeah, the the one where he's like the bow? Uh, yeah. Bro. The techno techno uh bro. Oh, uh, it was at least 81 pounds. Sorry. Yeah, so I was way awesome. over. Which is still high. That's still crazy. Big, yeah, 60 yeah. a 60 pound bow is a, a pretty fucking tough bow to pull back. Dude, he's got a a, you know, like the, you guys have seen those digital golf games where you yeah. hit the golf oh, ball yeah, into the yeah, screen. Yeah. I did it, see this. So it's hunting. Yeah. So you got real deer uh, and looks, elk. And looks so like, awesome. Oh, it looks so fun, dude. Oh, I'm not even a bow hunting guy and I want that. It's, Hell yeah. Yeah, we're going to have to get that one looks of super those. Fun. Yeah, so it says <laughs> there that it one. was 81 to maybe 130 pounds of force to be able to pull that thing. So, um, but yeah, you know, if you're looking for overall athletic performance, you're going to want to cross train. And here's the thing about kids and about, you know, especially when they get into junior high and high school, I think a lot of parents kind of get this false like notion that their kid is going to be yes. a superstar. Very and, false. And so they fuck them up by, 
you know, creating all these imbalances and doing all the specialized training when in reality your kid's good, but he's not going to be the best and you're probably better off, you know, cross training them so that they're healthy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So they don't have any problems. Like, like I use the example of the pitcher, but I don't know. Have you guys ever trained somebody who pitched, you know, most of their, their life? Like, yeah. Fuck the, it fucks them up. Yeah. Yep. You know, messes them up. So, yeah, there's a lot of Well, especially, work. especially that sport, because that yeah. one's really it's so one sided. Yeah. You, a picture, a picture, you're not only one sided, but you're also calling upon it like Dude. reps and reps. I'll, and reps, I'll tell yeah. you what, if you're, if you're a really good athletic trainer, um, you can, I don't know about you guys can do this. I'm pretty sure I can typically tell what sport oh yeah somebody plays a lot yeah. of by oh, easily their posture or how they move or like fighters boxers mm-hmm. forward shoulder they've all got that really bad forward shoulder and that's because when you're box and, and you know tend to shrug a little bit because when you're boxing that's how you cover yourself up yeah right. they hold themselves in that position all the time and they've got that you know kind of forward shoulder you see swimmers all the time they've got that interesting you know kind of forward shoulder similar but flat you know type of rib cage you see it in uh you know in lots of different sports you can kind of start to pick apart what sport they play because of how their bodies developed based on that sport. And then of course the self selection of the genetics that makes them, you know, good at that particular sport. Oh, so oh. very interesting. Check this out. If you don't have the mind pump app yet, you're not cool. Yeah. You're just you're one of those people. You're like, one of those other people. You're just not cool. So we have an app now in the app store. It's totally free. It allows you to uh, listen to our podcast through the app. It's better than your your regular iTunes app. It also has the ability to search our episodes. You can type in a search, you know, uh, whatever you want to search, look up, you know, muscle building, fat loss, keto, Adam's toenails, whatever you want to look up. (laughs) And it'll pull up all the episodes where we talk about those kinds of those little throwback. It pulls up uh, all the episodes where where we refer to those things. So you can start to listen to old episodes, newer episodes on topics that you may be interested. So go to the app store, download our free app, it's fucking awesome. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.